All right, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Anil Murthy, and uh, as Avi mentioned, I lead a synthetic product here at Kentic. And um, what I'd like to talk about today is obviously, you know, uh, synthetics and give you a general tour of the product. Um, but then I also want to kind of talk about our journey to building this product, and specifically, you know, what are sort of the decisions that we made about, um, you know, how we can bring more value to our customers who uh, may be using potentially another synthetic product today, um, and how that's led us to it, essentially this idea of autonomous testing. Um, so my goals today are kind of uh, two parts. The first part is gonna take most of the presentation. It's about synthetics. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, I'm gonna start with a super short intro of what it is. Uh, I'm sure all the folks on this call are super familiar with synthetics and know exactly how that works. But um, just for a broader audience, I'll do a quick, quick overview of that. Uh, I'll talk uh, in, in, in some detail about why we, meaning why Kentic decided to go build a synthetic monitoring product. Uh, I'll do a summary of features and then talk about what we're thinking about next. Um, and then towards the end, I'll talk about BGP monitoring. Uh, it fits sort of within our synthetic monitoring portfolio. Uh, and there similarly, I'll talk about our features today and then what we're thinking about in the future. Uh, now, in case you guys were wondering where or when the demo is gonna be, I have some bad news for you. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's actually gonna be multiple demos in this and I'm actually gonna split them across my entire presentation. Uh, so just to sort of remind myself to jump into the demo, I'm gonna put that little sign there uh, and, uh, and that'll be my cue. So jumping right in, uh, really quick intro of what synthetic monitoring is. Um, sort of a light way to start this off. On the left here is a dictionary definition of word synthetic. And uh, I was a little disappointed by the first, um, you know, sort of definition over there, which says that's not analytic. Hopefully when we get into the product, you'll see that is that it is plenty analytic. Uh, but then the other definitions down there kind of make sense to me, which is it's something that's produced artificially and it's um, devi devised for a specific purpose. Uh, so what's that purpose in the networking context? And that's sort of on the right side here. Uh, in, the, in the context of networking, synthetic monitoring is essentially about imitating different network characteristics. So these might be different traffic types. They might be different conditions in the network. Uh, they might be different locations that your users are accessing the network, network from or specific actions that they're taking that could potentially impact, get impacted by the performance of your network. Um, so that's kind of the high level of, of what synthetic monitoring uh, is, right? So, um, and then sort of jumping into a super simplified overview of how typically this is implemented. Um, let's, we start with something that we want to monitor the performance of. We can call this a target. Um, and then let's say there's this other thing that is capable of generating or simulating network traffic for us um, and user traffic for us. And let's call this thing an agent because it's going to be working on our behalf. Um, now let's say this agent is uh, capable of generating this traffic and, uh, uh, and then timing things as it sends the traffic over to the target and gets it back. Uh, and let's call, it, call this idea running a test. And, uh, and then let's say there's a platform that's capable of ingesting all this data that the agent is producing. Uh, and turning that into metrics. And so these metrics might be latency, packet loss, uh, DNS resolution time, so on and so forth. Uh, and then further, the platform is then able to take those metrics and uh, turn them into you know, KPIs, if you will. Um, and these are things that you can track over time. And the things like you know, availability of your services, uh, uptime on your network, spikes in the various metrics and so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of how synthetic monitoring is implemented. Um, now, if we can sort of take that idea and think about, you know what would it be like or what could we do if we had um, you know, many, many of these agents, thousands of these agents, uh, and these agents were deployed in various networks uh, of the world and various parts of the world as well, uh, what would that look like? And so um, turns out we don't have to actually imagine because that's kind of what we're building towards and we've built quite a bit of functionality around this. And so I'm gonna jump into the, the first demo here, uh, into the tab here. So here I'm in the product and um, as Avi mentioned, uh, there's a whole bunch of products under our platform um, all the products that you see here besides synthetic are things that are looking at, you know, passive traffic, if you will, or, um, you know, things that aren't actively generating traffic. Synthetix is uh, contrary to that, which is it's, you know, actively generating traffic. And then within synthetics, there's kind of three main areas, as you can imagine. Uh, there is agent management, which is where you would go and see the kinds of agents that are available for you to test with. Uh, there is the test control center, which uh, you can go and set up tests from and look at all the tests that are configured in the system. And then once you have all the agents and the tests configured in the system, the performance dashboard is really where you should be uh, spending most of your time looking at sort of the overall health of your networks. Um, so I'll start with agent management, which is uh, this page right here. Um, so what you're looking at is basically a global view of all the agents that are available in this particular account. 
Um, so every single dot that you see here that has a Kentic logo on it, that is representative of one or more uh, agents that Kentic has deployed in that location. Uh, and these are the agents that our Opt's team essentially manages and, and maintains as a service. Um, so if you're a new customer that signs up for a Kentic account and you log into your account, you'll see all of these agents already populated. And so these agents are what we refer to as global agents, and uh, um, they're essentially located in various parts of the world um, and also in various networks, um, all sorts of ASs out here, as you can see. Uh, a subset of these agents are located within the various public clouds. And so you can see we've got presence in all the major cloud providers here. Um, and those are what we refer to as public cloud agents. Um, and those are out here. Uh, now, outside of these agents, which Kentic provides out of the box, uh, we also let we also essentially take the same exact uh, software image that runs underneath these agents, underneath these global agents, and make it available to our customers uh, through a set of packages. Uh, and so, uh, customers can then take these take this package and deploy it on their own infrastructure, and that results in what we call a private agent. Um, so, in this account here, there's 16 private agents in installed. Um, they've shown up as these non-Kentic uh, logos on the map here. Um, so deploying these private agents is extremely simple. Uh, in fact, the procedures are right here in the product. You can click on the view procedures. So you can see here, we have got you know the most common packaging options covered here. Uh, there's a Debian, RPM, and a Docker container package here. Um, each of these requires two, maybe three steps to install an agent. Um, and we offer both x86 as well as ARM versions of this. So um, you know uh, the size of this agent is like, you know, it, it typically needs about two cores of CPU and two gigabytes of RAM. Um, so to put that in context, I literally have a couple of these agents running on the Mac that I'm demoing this uh, or presenting to all of you from. It also uh, uh, just runs out of the box on Arista, and we have a creepy little SFP if you trust uh, Chinese hardware and Russian software to put an ARM in an SFP slot and run the agent uh, because you can't get compute. So that's hysterical. Thank you. Again. I got a quick question. So if Go you're in a situation where you want to get an agent that's actually shared between You've got a corporate team and a production team. They both want visibility within the shared set of, uh, you know, like a AWS VPC environment because they both need access. One is looking at it from a production standpoint of availability. The other one is corporate for resource and access. Can you set that up? It looks similar. It would, I guess it looks similar to the public ones that you already have, but, you know, it's obviously only for that company. So how, how would something like that work? That would essentially be a private agent, uh, which is kind of what you're looking at. So. Um, essentially the, the same code that runs on these public agents, we make available as a private agent. And so customers can just go to uh, standard deployment uh, packages and download these, install them and get them to register within the product. But it can be accessed by two separate Kentuck accounts in terms of being able to get visibility to see see it because like the corporate team is not gonna want oh, access to everything. It. Got it, yeah. So today these agents are essentially bound to one single Kentuck account and that's how they essentially register themselves. So, you know, you can programmatically say, hey, this is the Kentic account I have, and you can install 100 of these agents. There's no sharing across multiple accounts, and that's not something that we've heard so far, at least, but if it's something that becomes important, we can certainly go to that as well. Right. You, you, um, we hear it uh, on the service provider side also, or like you know, a gaming right. company wants to work with a service provider. So mm -hmm. inside an enterprise, it would be more traditional to not take the Amazon approach of having 40,000 accounts, but, or, you know, but to have one Kentic account and then SSO, have everyone log in and describe what they can do within it. Um, uh, because our customers, because remember, we also do traffic, tend to be very sensitive about who can access that. Synthetix is a little bit less, um, but also there's APIs. So in theory, you could pull it for API. But again, as Anil said, if customers wanted us to cross the streams and open up that kind of sharing, we could, but traditionally different groups in an enterprise would all be in one Kentic account. They just have different users you know, within it. Uh, just right. The problem. The problem is, is that they don't like uh, allowing cross. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if they don't do that, then that would need to be a feature. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, all right. So yeah, you can uh, do things like label these agents, uh, and I'll show you how that gets used later in the product. Uh, but this is essentially the the idea of agents here. Um, I'll jump into the next thing that I want to show you, which is the test control center. So the test control center is kind of like the place where you'd go and look at all the agents, all the tests that are configured within the system. Um, here you can see a listing of all the tests that are running in this particular account. You can see the status of the test in terms of its overall health. And then uh, you can look at all the agents that are part of a given test. Um, and uh, from here, you can pause the test, you can start a test, you can clone it, delete it, so on and so forth. Um, 
And then to talk about the kinds of tests that we offer in the system today, I'm going to go ahead and click on this add test button here. And this brings me to the page that basically shows you kind of the, the types of tests that we offer today. Um, I'll come back to the autonomous tests a little bit later in my presentation. Uh, but just talking about these other basic tests first, um, you know, you can see we've got the, the most basic routing and network, network tests here. Um, you can start with something basic as an IP address test where um, you can specify one or more IP addresses here. Uh, go ahead and pick the agents that you want to test from. So these can be a combination of private agents as well as global agents. Um, and uh, if you had defined uh, those labels that I talked about uh, a minute ago, you can filter down to those labels and say, hey, just show me any label that's uh, any agent that's labeled with data center. It'll show you just that. Um, so you can go and add those without having to add all the sets of agents every single time. Um, so if I go ahead and pick any of these agents out here from this list and hit save, uh, what's going to happen now uh, is I'll give it a name, uh, optionally configure some notifications, which can be things like email, Slack, page duty, duty so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, once I hit save on this, uh, this is going to go ahead and create two tests underneath. So it's going to create a test from the first agent to this particular destination. And then similarly from this other one, uh, one's a global agent and one's a private agent running in my own data center. Um, and then if I want to get really granular, I have a bunch of advanced options here that I can go and tweak. Um, so right up front here is how often I want to be running this test. So uh, by default, we'll run a test every minute, uh, but you have the option of you know running it slower or running it faster. Um, I think we're, as far as I know, at least in, in sort of this kind of space where we're offering a synthetic monitoring product as a SaaS solution, we're probably the only company that's going down all the way to every second. Um, and this is kind of the thing that we refer to as continuous testing. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is given that uh, Kentix heritage is in, in flow monitoring and you know flow generally tends to have a much larger data set compared to synthetic testing, which is a much smaller data set. Uh, we're able to leverage the uh, economies of scale that we have sort of in our infrastructure uh, to pass on savings to our customers. And so if you were to install a private agent and set up you know, tests at a minute or at a second, they would cost you exactly the same. So you can write tests much faster um, at the same price point. Um, uh, health options out here. So like if you had a, a test which had you know 10 agents here testing a couple of IP addresses, you'd end up with 20 tests. Um, you can choose to say, you know, how many of these tests should be failing before the overall test is marked as a, as a failing, so, so to speak. Um, you can also configure your own custom thresholds for what uh, the fail states should be for ping, packet loss, and latency and, and jitter. Um, and uh, in the absence of configuring this, we'll essentially compute a baseline, and then we'll use that to automatically alert you um, without having to configure anything. Um, you can also con configure the number of probes that we're going to send. Um, so for every one of these agents in this test, we're going to send two types of probes. We'll send a set of ping probes and a set of traced out probes. Uh, the ping probes will be used for computing these metrics and alerting based on that. And then the tra traced out probes are used to build essentially a visual trace out that uh, Dan gave you a glimpse of during his presentation. Um, different protocol options in terms of how you want to, want to execute these um, uh, straight up ICMP or uh, TCP in case uh, you know ICMP is not reliable for the kinds of tests you're trying to do. Um, similarly, on the trace side, you can pick between UDP, TC, and TCP, and ICMP. Um, one of the things that we found out as we were working with our customers is um, if, you, if you're running ICMP um, ping tests or ICMP trace, uh, frequently, um, you know, if you're running these at a pretty high data rate, the upstream providers will sometimes um, you know, block ICMP traffic and that will result in false failures. And so we have the concept of an interprobe delay where you can say, I want to introduce a certain amount of delay between the successive probes that are going out. And that way I can slow down the data rate and make sure I don't create any false positives for myself. Um, any questions generally on this test before I show you an example of the results from it? Cool. Um, so here's an example of uh, one such test that's running. So this is a simple test that's basically doing a check to uh, the Cloudflare 1.1.1.1 DNS IP. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is first off a global view of all the agents that are part of this test. And so I can hover over any of these. I can see uh, where that agent is located as well as what targets it's testing to. Uh, and then there's a timeline here that shows me the results in every single minute. Since this is configured to be running every minute, I can sort of go back on this timeline. It'll update all the numbers as I go back and forth on this. Um, I can choose to do this across the last hour, which is the default, um, or I can go back all the way to so 30 days or you know, any time in the last one year, essentially. Um, and it'll sort of aggregate all that data and show me an aggregated view of the health of this particular test over that time frame. Um, the other thing you can do from here is I can click through on any of these uh, things. So for example, I'm gonna pick uh, this particular private agent and I'm gonna look at its details here. 
Uh, and so what you're going to see now is you, you're going to see a time series representation of those same exact metrics here. So you've got a latency, packet loss, and jitter, and we're showing you any spikes that have happened in the last one hour. Um, and the other thing that gets really interesting here is um, because Kentic has not just synthetic monitoring within its platform, but actual real flow traffic as well, we can correlate uh, the actual traffic that's flowing um, you know, potentially between those two targets in the same context and bring that to you here. Um, so the, the benefit here is if you happen to see like a spike or something and you're curious if it's impacting real user traffic, it'll show that to you right here. And then if you were to find something that um, looked like it's, it could potentially be impacting people, um, you can go ahead and click on this view, view in the Data Explorer. And uh, I think Avi and Dan both mentioned this. Um, this is something that you'll find pretty much through the entire platform um, where we'll integrate stuff pretty tightly between different products. And so you can get into this and then now you can look at, um, you know, you can do pretty much all the kinds of things that Dan was doing with, with the data earlier. Uh, so that's an example of uh, the kinds of, you know, data you can see from a simple ping test. Um, the traced out portion of it, essentially um, in that advanced config, by default, we're sending three traced out probes every minute uh, from the agent towards the target destination. And we're incrementing the DTL values on these packets to compute uh, essentially this visual trace. So what you can do from here is not only can you see uh, all the hops along the way, you can sort of hover over these and see what um, you know specific IP or um, you know nodes these are. Uh, we'll also show you what ASs you're going through. So there's a legend here that shows you you're going through Cloudflare and Amazon in this case. Um, you can choose to say, hey, just show me the ASs. I don't want to see all the hops, and it'll just drop down to the ASs right there. Um, the other thing that you can do from here is you can say, um, I want to see any links that are exceeding a certain latency. So um, right here is a threshold where I can go and say, you know, show me all the links that are exceeding 50 milliseconds. And right now there is none, uh, everything looks good. Actually, there is one here. So if I go over this time here, um, you'll see that there's a couple of uh, links as I have our back and forth here uh, that um, are highlighted in red. And so you can see the latency here between these two hops is 90 milliseconds. And so the, the threshold essentially is triggered at that point and it quickly shows you points of failure potentially. Uh, similar things you can do on the packet loss side, which will look at the total number of traces coming into a given node and the total leaving and compute essentially a loss value that you can um, sort of uh, highlight using these thresholds. Uh, and then in the middle here is essentially what we refer to as the hop to trace um, a distance correlation. Um, so the idea here is that um, if there is accurate GeoIP data about these nodes, what we're able to do is essentially um, compute an estimate of what the total distance is between uh, you know, a given set of nodes or across the entire trace, and then correlate that to the total number of hops that you're going through. And so the, the intention of building this was as you scroll back and forth on this timeline and you see sort of the uh, trace route change, meaning this traffic going through different hops uh, at different points of time, you can see if you know, the increase in the number of hops has changed the amount of latency that's introduced. And so that's a good debugging tool. Um, you can also do things like hover over the agent here. It'll show you where the agent is located. Um, it'll show you what specific site it's part of, if that's something that you configured within Kentic. And then you can click through from here and get into, again, the, the flow side of things and look at that. Um, you can also see a plain uh, raw trace route, if that's something that you want to look at and you're used to looking at it. Um, if this had you know, multiple targets, you'd see just you know, five, six, seven trace routes in parallel uh, shown, shown to you over here. The, the, the coolest part about this is you know, the way we've sort of integrated uh, flow and SNMP into this information here. Um, so if you happen to have nodes that are part of your data center, or if you're running um, you know, this test between uh, two points that are entirely within your own network, uh, and these nodes are sending Kentic data that includes SNMP as well as flow, uh, we'll pull all that data here. Um, so the benefit you get here is not only can you see when there's a latency or a packet loss issue in the trace route, but you can actually see if there's potentially uh, things happening on the interface or uh, the device that could be possibly causing that. Um, so in this particular instance, there is no CPU and memory being reported for the SNMP, but I'll show you another example shortly where you can actually see that information as well. Uh, so that's just a simple example. I'll show you one more example here of a slightly different test. So um, going back here to the artist page, um, uh, we have similar tests at the DNS and web layer. So I'm going to pick this web test as an example. Uh, the web test essentially here is able to execute specific HTTP methods. So by default, it'll do a get, but you're also, you can also do a post or a put or a patch um, uh, to a specific uh, you know, uh, URL out there. Uh, and you can optionally choose to run a ping and trace out as well. So what we'll do is if you specify a given URL here, 
uh, we'll do HTTP GET, and then when we resolve the actual IP address, we'll go ahead and set up ping and trace out to that same post as well, so that you can sort of correlate things together. Um, and then, you know, if you were doing a post um, out here, you can specify, you know, things in the body that you would like to send over to the server as well. Uh, well advanced... Yeah, go ahead. Got a question in regards to the URL and full qualified domain. If you got v4 and v6 and you're getting an A and a quad A record set, which one yes. are you using? Are Your you choice. Using... So yeah, so you well, by default we'll look at both, uh, and we'll, we'll basically get um, you know set up things to both of those uh, IPs, but you can choose to the only one if you like. Okay, and are you doing anything in terms of application behavior to recognize whether a particular host operating system is doing, you know, is doing happy eyeballs if you're doing it as as, as a as a characteristic to recognize what's going on, like Apple OS does a heavy preference towards towards the overall performance of latency performance. And so if you're on a Apple device, it's going to prefer that versus like if you're on Windows, you're just going to do the NCSI check and if, if for the first time and then just determine whether you use V4 or V6, depending on availability, right? Yeah. So yeah. So today we don't do all those checks. And I think it's something that we can probably consider doing as we get to sort of the endpoint stuff that um, that Avi was talking about. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it on our roadmap as well. Okay. Yeah, generally people are running the agents <clears throat> and um, there's a, uh, I'll just say no DNS trickery, although it's saying no well, DNS trickery makes me laugh, but. Um, yeah, I mean, dot and doe really breaks all of that, right? So yeah. if you got, if you got Chrome in your, in your, in your default setting, and then there's yeah. stuff you back to Google for, for all right. of that on the V6 side, well, you'll never see that traffic, right. right? So. Yeah. As Anil said, when we do the endpoint, which we're up in the era on, on, on browser plugin, but certainly endpoint agent. Um, right. We have headless Chrome, but it's in our agent. Like it's the 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 full page download is in our agent. We're not using, you know, the 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 forward browser, so we can control, you know, how the DNS is is done for our own tests. When we do, you know, endpoint browser plugin type things, then yeah, absolutely, you know, all that will be in there. Uh, and right. and do and dot <clears throat> uh, are something we see because when we do a lot of our service providers want us to do OTT tracking. And for that, we okay. need DNS plus flow. And so, you know, there's an impact there too. So, yeah, at least you're on the end client. So, TLS3 is not as big of a right. deal yeah. for you. Right. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, similar options out here, um, a few different ones. So, one of the things you can do here is you can say ignore TLS errors. Um, you know, one of the things that we commonly find with network teams that we talk to is, they don't care as much about you know uh, knowing if a certain thing is failing because if the SSL certificate is out of um, you know is expired. Uh, similarly, on the HTTP codes, like you know some things getting redirected and stuff, don't care about failing on that. You can choose to sort of say, hey, this particular code is fine. So if you get a return code, don't fail the test. So on and so forth. Um, so just to show you sort of an example of what the results from this look like, I'm going to pick this one here. So here we're doing a HTTP get to the ESPN.com uh, domain, and uh, we're looking at data over the last two weeks. And so you can see, um, you know, this is this test is intentionally um, sort of fabricated to fail on the private agents here, uh, just for demo purposes. Um, and so you see that in the last two weeks, there's a bunch of points where um, things were in a warning or a critical state, and we're seeing a huge amount of packet loss. So this is the kind of information that you'd get if you had a real um, network issue. Um, the interesting thing about this is that, um, you know, we essentially, when we do an HTTP get, we do a, um, uh, a lookup to the, the, the um, time to last byte. Uh, and so we can also pull the response size that we get from it uh, in addition to the status code. Um, so if you see sort of an anomaly as you're going back and forth on this where um, something returned less than what you expect, um, you can sort of debug that a little bit further. Uh, the thing that's most interesting and that's something that uh, network teams tell us is valuable to them is when you're sort of in a situation where you're getting tickets about your application or service having problems, being able to quickly say that it's not the network, as Avi mentioned probably at the start of his his slides, uh, that's something that you can do with a test like this, where you can see, you know, as you're scrolling back and forth in this, and you see a significantly high, um, you know, latency, you can quickly see if it's uh, latency that's introduced at the HTTP layer or it's latency that's introduced at the network layer. Uh, and then when you find such issues, you can sort of go back into the details here. And uh, you can sort of see if it's a one-time occurrence or if it's something that um, has occurred pretty much as a trending thing over time. Um, so what we'll do here is we'll show you uh, a representation of these different uh, stages of the HTTP uh, lookup, including domain lookup time and, and connect time and, and response time. And we'll break it down into the constituent pieces. Um, so as you're seeing spikes out here, you can sort of hover over this and see 
you know, uh, what was contributing the most amount to it? Was it domain lookup time and so on and so forth? And this is a quick way for network teams to be able to sort of rule out the network, if you will. Um, and then of course, the uh, flow visibility right here in that same context. Um, similar path view, uh, since in this case, we decided that we're going to run uh, ping and trace alongside the, um, the uh, HTTP lookups. Um, and then uh, if it happens to be running from a location where you have visibility from the nodes, uh, we'll pull all that information out here. Um, so this particular example happens to be a node that's actually sending us SNMP data for CPU and memory. Um, so if you had you know, packet loss issues happening or congestion on the, that particular link, um, you can actually go in here and see, hey, is this particular node running out of memory or, or and that's resulting in dropping packets, so on and so forth. If, and if you're sending flow or other data, you click on it, go to the rest of Kentech, you know, so that it's all integrated together, so. Yeah, so you can click on that. And in this instance, what I did is I actually went here and uh, I don't know if anybody picked up on this, but that's actually a, um, a Cisco Catalyst 8000 device right there. Uh, and I clicked on that and it's basically taking me to uh, that particular device in the flow information here. And uh, I can see here the various ASs that this is sending traffic to, um, applications that are running on it, countries, so on and so forth. Cool, so that's a kind of a quick overview of the agents and test. Um, I'll move on to the next part of my presentation here. So, you know, we talked about, you know, what you can do with these agents and the kinds of tests you can set up. But then one of the questions that we asked ourselves and we, you know, sort of constantly ask our customers as well is, why would you use something like this? And so, you know, I'll give you sort of two data points here. One is a little bit anecdotal, and then the other is more uh, sort of structured. Uh, the anecdotal data point uh, is, you know, something that I heard on a recent customer call, which was this phrase, uh, latency is the new outage. Uh, and so this really picked my interest. And I was like, you know, do what people most commonly do is just go and Google the thing and see if it's a, it's actually a thing. And, uh, you know, it turns out not only are people talking about this, so you see these different organizations that, you know, are known for their um, good, you know, service, uh, talking about latency being the new outage. Uh, but then right there in the results, there's sort of this meta point that uh, Google cares deeply enough about latency to show it right there in the results. And so, you know, despite the fact that they're a dominant player in the market, they want to, they're paranoid about latency to show it to you right there. Um, so this is all this is to just say that uh, the shift to delivering anything as a service has essentially raised the bar for network performance. And latency is probably the primary proxy of that performance. And, and this is sort of where synthetic testing really comes into the fold, right? Um, but then sort of talking about it more structured, um, you know, this is sort of the, the main use cases that we have surfaced up from more than a hundred conversations with, with our customers. Um, and this spans, you know, service provider, digital enterprise, as well as corporate ID teams. Uh, and we've talked with NetOps and NetInch teams across all of these uh, segments. Uh, and it, it goes from, you know, the most basic that applies to everybody, which is you know, we want to be able to monitor things proactively and know about things before they impact our customers um, to the more, you know, specific things. Like if you're a service provider, you might want to be optimized, trying to optimize routes. So you want to run synthetic checks across um, different routes and then decide and sort of combine that with cost, uh, which, you know, something that Kintic provides as well and make decisions about whether you want to be switching uh, your traffic to a different route. Um, Another thing on the service provider side, and, and it's something that you know we have customers using our product and our API to do right now, is to produce what I call a live SLA report. Um, so you know, being able to run uh, a set of synthetic tests, pull that data into um, either an internal or an external view, and uh, present it as an SLA report. That's not just a one-time thing, but it's actually a live thing. Um, uh, some of the other ones here, uh, if you're a digital enterprise and uh, you you're implementing um, you know some sort of a checkout feature, maybe you're Samsung and you've got uh, people checking out phones and you're making calls to, you know, various other services out there, whether it's, um, you know, telcos or it is payment services, being able to find where the issue is, whether it's, you know, your service, the third party service or the internet in the middle, things like the path view and, the, and sort of the correlation between apps and networks is really, really important there. Um, so just some of the use cases here. So um, one of the themes that sort of came out from all these conversations and it's sort of, again, this meta theme is, you know, is it me, meaning is it my network or is it the general internet? Um, and when I say the general internet, I'm talking about things like, you know, public cloud providers, SaaS applications, DNS service providers, um, everything, all of these things are provided as a service. And so they could be impacting uh, your performance and, you know, knowing about whether it's your issue or, uh, you know, a general internet issue is very important before you start spending time on it. Uh, and this is sort of my next portion of my demo. And so I'm going to go back here and talk about our performance dashboard, uh, the third item on the synthetic list here. So the performance dashboard, as I mentioned before, is the uh, view that you'd look at on an ongoing basis once you have your agents and your tests configured in the system. Um, so this is sort of split into these different tabs here. 
the very first tab is uh, very specific to the customer, meaning it's very specific to the specific account that you're looking at. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is up top an incident log, which is uh, showing you all the tests that are in some sort of um, you know, alarming state, whether it's a warning or a critical. Uh, and like the rest of the product, you can sort of go back in time here and look at which tests were in, in a given state at a given point of time, right? So you can go back and forth here. Uh, down here is, is uh, one of the visualizations that we've built uh, that's very custom, uh, you know, to uh, very applicable to service providers, but potentially other um, types of customers as well. And this is what we refer to as the mesh view. Um, so the idea here is you can build one of these views uh, by just clicking a couple of buttons where uh, you might have, you know, 10, 15, 30, 50 uh, points of presence across the world and you deploy agents in each of these points of presence. Uh, you click a, click a couple of buttons and we create this view where uh, you're looking at performance checks running between each of these pops. Um, so in this case, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight pops. So you've got eight times seven or you know, 56 tests running over here. And it's all represented in this clean view here. Um, you, know, you can look at this and say, at any given point of time, are there points where um, there could potentially be uh, congestion happening? And so those are indicated by colors on this uh, grid here. So everything that's got green dots on it is good. Uh, you can hover over it. You can see the uh, the traffic going one way as well as the traffic coming back in the opposite direction. If you notice that something's off, you can hover over it and see which specific metric is is uh, is uh, exceeding a certain threshold. Um, so that's the mesh view, uh, extremely popular among our service provider customers. Um, in the performance dashboard here, the other things that you're seeing here, and you, you, you may notice it Dot says it's free. Um, this sort of goes to that second point, which is when you have an issue and uh, you know before you start debugging into your own tests and, and engaging other teams, you want to rule out the internet. And so the way we surface this up in a product is through these free tabs where what we did is um, we, we said, hey, Corporate ID teams care about uh, ensuring good performance to various SaaS applications that they provide their employees. Um, why don't we just take you know, a certain number, 15 of our global agents located in various parts of the world and create checks to the most common SaaS applications that people use. And so we polled our customers and we said, hey, what are the top common applications that you use? This is kind of that list here. Uh, and each of these is basically running checks from 15 of our global agents uh, to that specific uh, service. And it's displaying that results out here. Um, and then if you know customers want to request new ones, they can just click here and, and send us you know a specific thing and we'll if it's reasonable enough, we'll add it to this list. Uh, similar to this, uh, if you're not a corporate IT uh, customer, but you're instead a, a SRE team or, or some uh, somebody that uses cloud uh, and you have tickets coming in about your service that's in production, you want to quickly rule out if it's you know an issue with the cloud provider itself. Um, so what we've done here is we have leveraged our mesh tests, which which I just talked about a, a minute ago. Uh, to essentially create these continuously running meshes for the various common cloud providers. So you've got AWS, Azure, Google, um, as well as a multi-cloud mesh, which is you know becoming more and more popular among uh, people that use cloud. Um, you know, running one service uh, in AWS and running a different service in in GCP because GCP does that really well. Uh, and so you know, on a given day, if you're running, if you're getting a whole bunch of tickets about um, you know your service that's in, deployed in AWS, the first thing you can do is come in here and see is a particular region completely gone dark. So if you, if you notice all of this gone gray or you know, alerting in some ways, then you know there's something going on there. Uh, I'll skip over BGP and come back to this later, but uh, we've got a similar concept going on for DNS performance. So we've taken basically the top DNS service providers and created checks from you know, a bunch of our global agents to them, and we can show you that information here as well. So coming back here, that's kind of our, our um, way of giving people tools to rule out the internet, if you will. Um, so now jumping to sort of talk about our journey to building this product, um, you know, we sort of asked a question, should we even go build this and, and why should synthetic and traffic be in the same place? Is there something more valuable to it um, rather than people just going and uh, getting a synthetic monitoring solution from somewhere else? Um, and so the, the, the question really was, does it really ha help to have active measurements, which is synthetic testing, as well as passive, which is, you know, NetFlow, SFlow, CloudFlow, so on and so forth. Uh, network telemetry in the same platform. And, uh, you know, besides the most obvious things, which is, you know, it, it helps to consolidate tools and vendors and uh, having a single pane of glass is nice. Um, those are the most obvious ones. Uh, it turns out there's actually something cooler that you can do with having both of these data together. And uh, this sort of brings me to, uh, you know, the, the questions about what it is that each of these data sets provides you. And so the way we like to look at it is that traffic monitoring, which is NetFlow, SFlow, SNMP, so on and so forth, 
uh, it tells you uh, answers to one set of questions, which is, you know, what is the state of your network? Um, this might be questions like, how is the traffic flowing between my data center and my cloud instances? Um, what apps are consuming the most amount of bandwidth? Uh, how much am I spending uh, on egress costs, so on and so forth? Synthetics, on the other hand, is all about uh, what might happen to your network if a certain set of conditions were true. Uh, and so these might be things like, you know, uh, a certain service provider going down, how is that impacting your uh, performance or is it causing issues to your customers? Uh, or if you add a new DNS server instance, are the right set of users hitting that DNS server instance? And so the way I look, try to look at this is, um, you know, these are extremely complementary in my mind um, and uh, almost, you know, just to sort of use a somewhat cheesy analogy here, it's almost like peanut butter and jelly. So um, the, the things to sort of take to the next level is, yeah, it's, it's nice to have both of these together and they answer a different set of questions and together, you know, sort of uh, lead to network observability, but then can synthetic testing truly benefit from awareness of traffic, right? And I think somebody brought this up early on when Dan was doing a present, his presentation, um, you know, can you sort of automatically set up tests for me when you're spinning up these VPCs? And that's sort of exactly what we've built here, not specifically for cloud, but, um, you know, uh, essentially, if the platform is able to use this traffic awareness to do a couple of things, uh, it can it can sort of save a lot of time. And so the first is the ability to sort of recommend uh, networks or paths or applications to test um, based on the type of traffic. Um, so if you have, you know, a few kilobytes of traffic going to a certain portion of the internet or a certain portion of your network, you probably don't care about doing synthetic checks all day, there all the time. But if you're sending a gigabyte of data to some other portion of your network, you definitely want to be monitoring that with synthetics. Um, and then after you recommend things, uh, if you could find a way to set up and refresh these tests auto automatically, or what we like to call autonomously, um, because not only is it setting it, setting it up, but it's also refreshing it over, over a period of time, that really brings value to customers because now you're not spending all of your time setting up and maintaining these tests. Um, and this sort of gives, brings me to my third demo, which is uh, a demo of our autonomous tests. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump back into the product here and uh, go back to the ad test page. So these tests, which I didn't talk about so far, uh, is what we refer to as autonomous tests. And the idea here is rather than you having to pick a specific IP address or a host name that you want to set up tests towards, um, all you need to have is an intent, um, an intent to test performance towards a specific network entity. Uh, and this network entity might be an ASN, it might be a CDN, it might be a country, region, or a city, right? Uh, and then once you have that intent and you say, hey, I want to uh, I'm curious about you know the types of ASNs that I should be testing. What we'll do is, uh, assuming we have awareness of your traffic as a, as sent as gleaned by um, getting your flows from your edge devices, we can uh, essentially run a query and say these are all the ASNs that are sending you traffic, and this is sort of the top ten of the list of that. Right? We can do a similar query and say this is all the ASNs that are getting traffic from you, uh, and this is that top ten list. And then from this list, we can tell you which of these ASs are being monitored with synthetic checks and which are not being monitored with synthetic checks, right? Um, and so then what you can do is you can say, hey, uh, I'm sending a ton of traffic to Apple, but I'm not doing any synthetic checks on it. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Now what we'll do is we'll run a second query. And what the second query will do is it'll say, now that you said you're, you have an intent to test performance towards the Apple AS, I'm going to go ahead and see what sites you have that are sending traffic towards Apple, right? And so that's the breakdown that you see here. And uh, you're seeing that there's you know, uh, nine gigabytes going from gigabytes per second going from this um, Chicago site, uh, but there's no synthetic checks configured here. So I'll make a recommendation here to add an agent. Um, so when I click on this, it'll basically walk me through the uh, process of adding a private agent here. And then once I have that agent, I can go ahead and uh, pick that agent and uh, you know configure notifications if I want. Um, the cool magic that happens here is uh, rather than you having to specify, go and find IP addresses within Apple's AS and, and you know, create one, one test to it, we'll go ahead and do all that heavy lifting for you. Um, so what we'll do by default is we'll find the top 10 IP addresses by traffic and we'll set up one test each to each of those IP addresses. Uh, you can control how many of these we set up so that you're not setting up too many tests and spending a lot of credits on them. Um, and then you can also control how many providers, meaning how many sort of transit providers on the way you want to track along with this test. So that's kind of the, the autom initial automatic setup of this test. Now, where it gets really autonomous is in the fact that not only will we set it up initially, we'll actually repeat the same query every so often. Um, so by default, we'll run the same exact query every 12 hours. And if we find any new IP addresses 
that uh, show up. And if we find any of the existing IP addresses, IP addresses not returning, um, you know, synthetic checks, we'll remove the stale IP addresses and we'll add new ones to them. So this test essentially sort of maintains itself autonomously over time. And so that's essentially the idea here. Um, similar concept with the other one. So if you had a list of CDNs, we would show that here, countries, regions, so on and so forth. Um, and in terms of how this gets presented, uh, here's an example of that. So here we're saying we want to test performance towards um, Equinix's AS uh, from a bunch of our Acme sites here. Um, so not only are we running, not only are we finding IP addresses automatically for you and uh, setting up tests from them, uh, 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 one test each to those IP addresses, uh, but where we can, we'll actually pull out information about the provider and the transit uh, and the connectivity type. Uh, we'll show you the potentially impacted traffic in that same context there along the, the synthetic measurements. And then up top here, we'll show you a SAN key representation of the traffic as it's flowing to each of these uh, points that we picked to, uh, to do synthetic checks for. And so, you know, this sort of puts in context, uh, you know, you want to be looking at performance issues in areas where you have the most traffic. So that's essentially the idea with autonomous testing. Um, I'll pause there for a second, see if there's any questions before I move on. Cool. Yeah, I think you, you touched a little bit about on uh, pricing. Can you give me a sense of how you price this out? Yeah, really straightforward actually. So um, essentially our, uh, uh, there's, first off, there's no cost for installing any of these agents. So you can deploy hundreds of thousands of these private agents is absolutely zero cost to doing that. There's no cost for configuring tests. So if you have a test configured and it's not running, like this one here is paused, uh, it'll consume zero credits. The only time we'll actually charge you anything is when you're actually running a test, right? So any test that's running here, you, it'll show you uh, if you left this test running through the end of the month, that's how many credits it'll consume. Uh, and in terms of how these credits get calculated, it's essentially a combination of the type of agent that you're running. Uh, if you're running a private agent, which is deployed on your own infrastructure, and it's consuming your your compute and storage as well as bandwidth, uh, that's typically uh, half the price of a global agent test. Um, and the general ballpark is, you know, a private agent is going to consume about two and a half credits uh, every minute for the time that the test is running, and a global agent is going to consume about five credits every minute. Um, and then uh, depending on how frequently you run that, uh, every minute, every five minutes, every 30 minutes, um, that goes you know, further down or up, so on and so forth. And because any costs is... around, uh, sorry, any costs around distance, like I want to test, is it different to test from within the US to from the US to global, that doesn't matter? Nope, nope, doesn't matter at all. So same cost regardless of where the agents are. <clears throat> and the price per unit is significantly cheaper than other folks who focus really only on synthetics because we're really trying to build it uh, and incent people to use it across the platform. And in fact, when you use Kentec for really anything, you get uh, millions of credits included. And it's something, as I said, New Relic is including two, two and a half million credits to all of their customers uh, to let people have access to, to get into it as well. So really wanna make it um, uh, consumable and usable widely. But to your point, Drew, we don't give every second testing on the internet because uh, from South Africa, because that would be that's that's the private agent side. So, yeah, and and on the on the topic of credits, we're extremely transparent with all this. So, like you come into the into the uh, product on the performance dashboard, you'll see that information out here. When you go and set up any test, um, we'll tell you right up front. Like if I was to go pick this test here, and uh, you know pick a private agent, uh, and hit save, it'll immediately tell me how many credits is going to consume down there. Um, so, like if I was to remove this now, it'll say zero right there. So extremely transparent with all this. So you can you can choose you know how often you want to run these, um, you know how many tests you want to configure, or you want to change them, when you want to pause them, so on and so forth. I've got a slightly related question, but it's a little different. That's it's around cloud. So uh, many of the customers that I'm dealing with have Direct Connect, Express Route, et cetera. Those are all flat fee. They're trying to really, or as much as they, as they can negotiate around those. They're really trying to optimize how much traffic they can get in and out of them. So some of the ones that I'm dealing with upload very large medical data sets for getting crunched and their challenges, you know, they picked up a, you know, 60 gig connection. They can't, they can't fill it, right? They can't fill the pipe, even though they have plenty of data on one side versus the other trying to fill it. So what they're really trying to measure is how do we, how do I get the right parameters to optimize getting network flow to go from my on-premise location, from my data center up across that link and load data into 
the AWS cloud, for instance, or for this case, it was GCP because they're, they're making use of, of the GPU uh, capabilities within GCP. So their challenge is really filling the pipe, not, not looking at other characteristics. Do you guys have anything that actually helps to inform the customer like, hey, your window sizing is crap, or you need to, <laughs> you need to optimize your switches in this way in order to, to really help fill the pipe, or no, you just need to run you know, 15 more servers to start streaming the data across. Like the help in that area is huge. You guys are helping in terms of like the areas that are what I consider sort of the negative space, right? Of like, this is the performance downgrade, but what can I do to increase my performance to, to make that better? Um, is, do you have anything road mapped or anything that you, you guys are thinking about in terms of that? So I can, I can give, a, I can answer really quick on the synthetic side. And then I think Dan might have, Dan or Avi might have more to add on the cloud uh, flow side. So on the synthetic side on a roadmap, which you'll see shortly, um, we have uh, mm. potentially the idea of doing throughput <laughs> and, and you know, bandwidth testing, so to speak, and being able to pump a whole bunch of traffic or find other ways to essentially like, um, you know, get a sense for what the capacity of your link is and whether you're actually getting that. Um, but then that's something that's definitely on the roadmap. Uh, I don't know, Dan or Avi, you want to add something? Yeah, on the insights roadmap is is combining those things about what we see from the server side if we see eBPF, where we can get kernel TCP stats and see what's going on in the kernel um, through to the synthetics. That's definitely the kind of multi-domain correlation uh, that we plan to do. And yeah, we decided not to start with the machine guns shooting through the propellers, which is sort of the iPerf plus synthetics testing. But uh, as Anil said, we have a lot of customers that want us to do that, but we need to be respectful so that we don't have the Heisenberg, you know, of uh, of the monitoring affecting the network. So just need to do Yeah, that. I mean, it's 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 going to become a more and more common use case as, yeah. as people use the cloud exchange with Equinix and they're trying to yep. optimize how much traffic they're getting across each one of yeah. the cloud providers and making yeah, sure absolutely. that they're hitting that 98, they want to hit that 98% threshold of, yeah. of utilization because then their dollars, the dollars that they spend for that service is, is, is pretty optimized. And that's very symmetric with, you know, the IX, we're not going to get to it this NFT, but the, the IX focused use cases of Kentic and the billing, you know, an average versus 95th and optimization, you know, it's a core on the, on the interconnect side, it's a core side that we want to make sense on the cloud side too, but really making the recommendations, tying these things together, that's pretty core roadmap, but you know, yeah, or even right, you're even right sizing because like with Equinix yeah. with the cloud exchange, it's got an API. It's like, yeah, yeah we're not using any, we, we're recognizing time of day. We see all the patterns. <laughs> we can go ahead and roll down yeah. that, that, that sizing of that configuration. Same thing with packet, right. For, for yeah. the, for the metal as a service components, yeah. you could do the same. Thing. Yeah. We're, we're working with them because they're a customer. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, Actually, the lab you're seeing is running in, in Equinix Metal. Um, and uh, Tell Zach I said hi. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, cool. Cool. All right, so sort of bringing it all together, um, our mission with Synthetix essentially is to basically build a platform that monitors everything for you, um, whether it's you know in your cloud networks, hybrid networks, non-cloud networks, whatever that might be, and do that essentially with a simple and very affordable pricing, right? Um, so as you've seen, hopefully we have coverage across global agents and private agents, um, testing across the various layers from network to routing to DNS to web. Uh, and then we have a full API that you can use to pull all this data. Uh, we have customers that pull it and sort of create uh, publicly viewable dashboards, for example, uh, to showcase their own performance. Uh, and then you can use, use the firehose to push all this into a third party data lake, uh, if you will, or any other systems. Um, we talked about the key innovations in terms of autonomous testing and continuous testing. Uh, the mesh testing I mentioned is, is something that's extremely popular with our service provider customers. Uh, and then, you know, the, the whole merging of data, um, uh, synthetic data and flow data to give you uh, more insights to debug issues with a path visualization. Um, so just a quick summary of, of what synthetics is today. Um, uh, to sort of share that in a, in a different fashion, it's sort of split into two sets of capabilities, uh, a set of testing capabilities and then a set of workflow capabilities. Um, the colors here essentially represent what's available today, which is everything in green. Uh, the Everything that's in blue is stuff that we're looking at doing uh, this year, um, hopefully. And then uh, everything that's grayed out is stuff that is up for consideration in uh, 2022. Um, so as you can see, uh, hopefully as evident from the colors here, our focus so far has been heavily on the network and routing layers and on making sure we build out, um, you know, sort of the workflow capabilities for people to be able to uh, configure, customize, 
um, get alerted on, get notified on, share and export um, and automate those tests, right? Um, so that's what you can ho hopefully see reflected in the colors, uh, colors here. Um, a couple of things that- like, um, Yep. Got a quick question on that. It's the, the the Terraform provider, is that for a Terraform provider for Kentec or are you guys building something different there in terms of like a different integration? It is it is for Kentec. So essentially what the, this provider will do is um, let you use Terraform to be able to instantiate tests um, and potentially uh, use it to instantiate agents within wherever you want to. So if you're, <laughs> um, so for example, we have customers that, um, you know, one, one particular example was a customer that uh, had, their security team had a requirement of them needing to um, refresh their armies every so often. And so they wanted to be able to reinstall the agent and make sure that it's, it has continuity. Um, those kinds of the, are the kinds of use case we're trying to solve with this. Um, and our Terraform yeah. provider also registers clouds and uh, devices as well. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's it's Ansible, our... Ansible, Python, and Go you know, APIs, uh, libraries also, so. Cool. The other one that's cool, and it's uh, sort of in the open source uh, area as well, is this live SLA report. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've seen customers basically create these meshes uh, for their 30, 40 pops across the world and uh, not only consume them internally and get alerted on it, but also want to sort of display this to their external audiences and say, hey, this is the kind of performance we're giving you. And so it's we've seen it enough at this point where uh, we have decided that we're going to basically build this live SLA report, uh, a reference web application for it and open source it. So anybody can take that, tweak it and make it their own, so to speak. Uh, that's just basically a quick summary. Uh, I know we're running pretty close on time here, so I'm gonna make sure I get to the the one last thing I wanted to do. Uh, and uh, I sort of wanted to compete a little bit with Dan and, and Avi on this because I had no memes on mine. So, um, uh, and, and this is not joking. So we, we are actually working on a BGP monitoring solution and, and our goal is to be able to alert, uh, be, be able to catch and alert things in real time, which I think uh, as far as I've seen, no other solution out there does. Um, so to talk about our BGP monitoring plans here, um, First off, right off the bat, it's technically not synthetics. Um, it's uh, it's not going to be generating any traffic. What we're going to be doing is, uh, you know, establishing peering uh, BGP peering sessions with publicly available BGP monitors, which is primarily route views um, project today. Uh, but then also uh, doing the same that we already do with our own uh, Kentic private peers. So these are devices that customers have, um, you know, peered with us, and uh, uh, we get data from this. We have had these devices sort of forever in, in Kentix life. Um, and, uh, you know, this is kind of one of our key differentiators, I think, which is um, what I like to refer to as reach, which is how many of these vantage points do you have and how diverse are they? Meaning how, how many different types of networks and, and geographic locations are they located in? And so uh, our intention here is to try to shoot for about three times or more of the next, of the most common solutions that you find out there for BGP today. Uh, and we can do this because we have sort of been in the BGP business for a long time. Um, and then given that we're going to be um, using our own private peer data for this, uh, all of that data is going to be real time. Uh, and so the time to report and alert on any sort of BGP issues is going to be really fast. Um, you know, I've heard from many customers that use some of the other solutions today that, um, you know, there's a significant lag in terms of the data getting into the system. And then there's a significant lag in terms of getting alerted when certain issues happen. And this is simply because some of these public monitors um, aren't quite real time. Um, and so we're hoping that we can solve that with our, with our BGP monitoring solution as well. Um, in terms of phases on how we release all this stuff, uh, the very first couple of things that are green here is, is stuff that's already in the product. Um, and then the orange stuff is on the roadmap for this quarter. Um, so first off, we have this thing called the route viewer, which is essentially a free viewer for people to uh, go and put in any AS and um, you know prefix that they want to look at BGP updates on. Uh, and this is accessible right here um, in the product. And I actually skipped over it before, but I'm going to go, go to it now. So right here in the performance dashboard, um, there is a BGP route viewer, which is free to use. Um, so what we do here is if you're a Kentic customer already um, and you've onboarded into Kentic, we know what sort of ASs and uh, prefixes um, uh, are part of your network. And so what we can do is we can pull that information automatically into this view here. And then we will go and query our BGP data set and we'll produce this view. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the overall plans with BGP. And, uh, you know, I sort of want to end on this one, which is uh, setting up Avi a little bit. I don't know if Avi is going to get to slides, but uh, this is not all we do on BGP. There's a ton of other stuff we do on the flow side. And uh, hopefully Avi will talk. That'll, about that'll be next networking field day. But if I could grab the screen for one minute, Tom, and yep. show something that was a question from earlier. Uh, you know, there's a question about cloud native and process. And uh, we didn't have a whole section on it, but 
Um, we did we did actually a prior presentation on this. To us, whether it's cloud, which Dan showed, or SFlow, NetFlow, uh, or if you have an eBPF agent, then we can actually pull data about pods, containers, uh, processes, actually look at you know, Envoy, Prometheus, Kappa, which is our agent, and get process-centric views. Another thing that we want to work on to get network and application teams working together. So again, we take a very, very broad, diverse, and inclusive view of uh, traffic kinds of networking because that's the world we really live in. So late addition there, and I thought we might have some time to show what we do with BGP, but we'll, we'll save that for a future uh, field day. So. I'd like to thank everyone. And if there are any last questions on synthetics or. On, on the BGP side, are you guys also checking the, the uh, RPKI? Uh, yeah. Components of that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, we won't go through. Uh... Oh, yeah. Go, go, go for it, Greg. No, we're, uh, we're leveraging uh, the, uh, the, uh, the globally curated list of ROIs from uh, that Cloudflare is over via their CDN. And we do better than that. We color flows. <laughs> via RPKI in a way that uh, people can see what would the result be if they enabled strict validation in their network per prefix. Okay. So we would know you could actually look and say like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to drop those folks based off of the RPKI invalid. Status and, and or... Yes. And exactly the reason why both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We want That's people cool. to be comfortable doing it, even though I'd love to see path validation at some point, we've got to start somewhere. And our, our proxy also works as a, as an RTR speaker. So you can actually talk to your router for validation.